So I'm um, on my way up to Keen Electronics to shoot some footage for a couple of new toys that we have. Uh, that video is going to be later in the week, so stay tuned for that. I also had some Pi 4s delivered quite recently, and I'm really keen to get into testing those out. Anyway, I thought I'd stop in my busy schedule and announce the winners of the, well, it's not really a Raspberry Pi competition, it's really the Amiga LTE competition, but I used the Raspberry Pi 4 April Fool's video as the competition entry requirements. So my April Fool's video this year caused a bit of concern for some people. You know, the sort of people who are the uh, pitchfork and torch variety. But the rest of you saw the joke in the video and even went back for a second time to win one of two Amiga LTEs. To enter, you had to correctly identify as many guffs or as many purpose mistakes that I made in the video. That sort of gave it away as an April Fool's joke. So before I tell you the competition winners, how many mistakes did I put in? Roughly about 35, give or take a couple of really obscure ones. So let's see what they were. So last year I had the good fortune to be able to interview Eben Upton about the upcoming Pi 4. Yeah, interviewing. Okay, so the uh, background is actually a medical trade show from 2016. Uh, you can see DGM Pharma Apparat Handle. It's actually a pharmacy company. Interview someone you may recognise. Of course, he was a little cagey about it, but he did promise he would send me an early prototype. Uh, the interviewer is actually Jason Statham. Well, he sort of looks like me from the back. One thing to bear in mind is that before being sent this board, I had to sign a ton of NDAs to ensure that I wouldn't really leak any critical information. NDAs. Okay, the prototype date code is 1st of April 2019, and the serial number is actually ASCII hex for April Fools. Can't show you. That also means I can't... Yeah, personal letter from even. And also serial and date codes, and also QR code, which says April Fools. So what does the new Pi 4 give you? Starting from the top right, working clockwise. Two USB... So USB 2.0 ports, they're really not USB 2.0 ports. Which wasn't provided on this prototype. Yeah, I doubt the Pi Foundation would really give me a board looking quite so dodgy. Micro USB port looks really bad. And look, I didn't have much time to desolder it, so hey. SATA 3.0. Oh yes, finally. A header which I haven't... Uh, Eben Upton has made it very clear on many occasions uh, that he won't be releasing a Pi with a SATA controller on board. It is way too expensive, so don't expect it. A second HDMI out that apparently also can act as an HDMI in. If only it was going to be HDMI in, but I did actually correctly identify there was going to be two HDMI ports. Unfortunately, I didn't have any micro HDMI uh, because I just couldn't find any to uh, glue on. Microphone? No Raspberry Pi board I have ever seen has a microphone and it won't ever. Something that wasn't populated, but I suspect it's an audio jack. The basic footprint of this board is completely wrong. The Raspberry Pi will not change anything around at all. They will always try and maintain the same footprint, the same format. So even if you look at the Raspberry Pi 4 format, the two HDMI connectors are in a position where you could probably mill out a bit of the case to be able to have that fit in without too much of an issue. Of course the USB and gigabit ethernet ports are moved around slightly but generally it's the same sort of footprint so you're never going to see such a completely different board. DC jack, which I'm not surprised about. If they had used USB Type-C it would add too much to the overall cost of the board. Actually USB Type-C doesn't really add too much to the overall cost of the board. It's a much better method of being able to deliver power than DC jack and micro USB because micro USB is on the way out. It cannot deliver enough power. The only issue with USB Type-C is that it's not really mechanically sound. Not as mechanically sound as a DC jack. But anyway, it's here to stay. It's going to be around for a while. Mepi CSI 2. Reset button. No Raspberry Pi I have ever seen has a reset and power button and I doubt there ever will be. Another button which I couldn't find the purpose of. And interestingly, there's now two Pi headers. The first one is a standard Pi header. Yeah, <laughs> two Pi headers. The first one is actually fine. It has uh, plated through holes all the way through. But the second one, it just glued on with Araldite. So uh, you would have seen when I switched the board over that there's no plated through holes on the second side. And the second one is an extension of the first. And finally, an IR transceiver. 
You're never going to see an IR transceiver on a Raspberry Pi. A Realtek RTL8211 gigabit Ethernet. That's actually real. And transceiver. That's actually real What too. looks like some sort of Wi-Fi module under the prototype label. Okay, so the Wi-Fi module uh, from the Orange Pi, I had a bit of difficulty trying to get that off. And if you look closely, you can see that I completely destroyed a couple of tracks because there was a fairly large ground plane. And so I couldn't get enough heat to it, unfortunately. D-protection and buck converters. So they are actually ESD protection and DC buck converters. But if you look closely, you'll see that the DC buck converters have actually had their heads blown off completely because this is the board that I blew up in an earlier video. At least on this board, there's four gig DDR4 RAM. They are actually four gig DDR4 RAM and that is actually an eight gig eMMC module. But uh, unfortunately they're mirror reverse because the orange Pi format is around the other way and so I had to print out the label and completely flip everything in uh, post-production. Which I believe on the cheaper boards will be not populated. But if Too it expensive. is, it can be reflashed very simply using the micro USB port. That would be nice. An IC I haven't any clue about. Okay, so that particular IC is actually an STK3228. Uh, from Syntec Semiconductor. This is actually a semiconductor you'd find in IP cameras. Definitely something you wouldn't find in a Raspberry Pi. To do with the GPIO headers. And the thing that I'm pretty excited... Also, there's no pins connected to it. Unusual to find such a large semiconductor with no pins connected. Excited about is the fact that both the GPIO headers aren't being driven from the SOC, but rather from a custom FPGA. I can't really show you anything about this apart from the fact that it's labelled AF04. AF0401, April Fools, 1st of April. A GL830 PMIC. That's correct. And finally, a custom sock driving the whole shebang. Okay, so a custom sock, once again, uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation would not be veering away quite so dramatically from their standard format. Placing the sock underneath is way too different. Which, once again, I can't really tell you about. All I can say is that it is indeed an ARM chip and being manufactured by Philips, of all people. Okay, the Philips company, as it used to stand, no longer exists. It was sold off to a consortium uh, around about late 2006 and it eventually became NXP, which is still around, but Philips is no longer. It is a stack design, which I'm told provides much better <laughs> thermal control. Okay, so a stack design. So to the left, you might be able to see where I cracked the top of the semi when I was trying to remove it from the PCB. In the end, I just cut round the PCB with a hacksaw and filed the edges and colored them black so you wouldn't see that it's a PCB. And you can see on the left-hand side where there's a little bit of copper trace actually sticking out. Idea what the upper and lower layers are. And even if I did, I couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you. Now I've been told that the Pi 4 will come in four different flavours. The Pi 4 Maker Lite is the cheapest, aiming to be around at the same cost as okay, the current. Let's fast Pi forward 3. this. So I didn't have to reflash at all, which is nice. Okay, so this board actually would never be able to power up because I completely fried it. But what I did do was I used a green screen and simulated the LED flashing. And if you look pretty carefully, you can see where I didn't match up the green screen properly and can just make out my probe tips turning the LED on and off. Out of the box, you can boot from eMMC, nice. SD, Ethernet, and also SATA. Nice. Which is pretty cool. It's an old version of Raspberry Pi, a splash screen. You wouldn't have that on a newer Raspberry Pi. What came up was the familiar Raspbian desktop. Yep. Nothing really to see here, so moving on. Know that I'm running a 3 gigahertz 6 core SOC. 6 nice. cores. And <laughs> once again, the NDA I signed stops me from showing you just how much better this new yeah, software is think they'll be going to, to six cores. other SPCs on the market. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, stated pretty clearly they wouldn't be going to 6 cores, especially when you get down to uh, the level of silicon dye that they're using. So if you look fairly carefully, you can see the title bar has the directory of where I've actually placed the video, and you can see there's gags and bloopers. And also all the files have 1st of April as a date stamp. So you can see the close-up of the board where I've actually blown up a couple of the DC buck converters and regulators. You can see it pretty clearly there. Fantastic move by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. It positions this board light years ahead of any... Yeah, it would be nice if there was an FPGA, but unfortunately not. ...board means it suddenly becomes a real-time powerhouse. You could create three more SATA ports on this... Three more SATA ports, so that means there's four SATA ports 
Well, uh, you would need a fairly grunty FPGA to be able to pull that off. And not only that, I haven't really seen any open source implementations for a SATA controller. And the commercial ones I've seen are pretty expensive. Like we're talking tens of thousands of dollars just for the uh, licensing. Or fire up a Z80 CPU core on the FPGA you and use that. some of those headers to drive a VGA display. Okay, VGA display. VGA only requires 15 data lines and five of those are really ground related so I've actually put in too many of them. Pretty cool, then it can go up to 200 megahertz. Okay, 200 megahertz. Yeah, right. If you look carefully, 200 megahertz waveform uh, would produce a 5 nanosecond duty cycle. So the DSO is actually set to a resolution of 50 nanoseconds. So this waveform that you see here is actually a 3.6 megahertz signal nothing like 200 megahertz and really you wouldn't be able to toggle the gpios at 200 megahertz uh, just using software in terms of gpios there wasn't anything that didn't work okay so the rest of it really is fluff uh, even towards the end i tried to make it pretty clear that uh it was an april fool's video so who are the competition winners from the patreon entries we have stefan and from the subscriber entries, we have uh, Michael. Of course, you both know who you are because I've just sent you an email. Anyway, got to get going up to Keynes before it gets too late. Thanks for watching and see you later in the week. I think everyone will pick up on all the April Fool's references I'm making. Oh, sorry.